welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. So glad that you're with me today. Um, as you know, May is Lupus Awareness Month and I'm filming this in May of 2021. And all month long, we've been going through some great education about lupus, hoping to answer your questions and just fill in some information gaps and give you some things to think about um, to talk about with your own doctor at your next appointments. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because it really is all connected. So today's video, I'm going to be blowing through, it's a lot of information, but we're gonna be talking about some of the most common symptoms that we see in lupus patients. Now this is not going to be an exhaustive list by far, and just because I don't mention a particular symptom or a lab result that you have and you have lupus does not mean that what or that you don't have lupus or that what you are experiencing is super rare. Um, there's just not enough time to go over everything, and so I've really tried to talk to bring this down and talk about the things that I have seen and that the data supports are the most common symptoms. So let's get into it. All right, so I am going to organize this the way I organized um, my lupus lectures when I would teach medical students or young doctors, and that is by system. So the cardiovascular system or the nervous system, those kinds of things. And we're gonna start from the most common and then work our way to the not as common, although still pretty common, because as I said, some of, these system, some of these symptoms will be seen in most lupus patients. So let's just get into it. And that is the first system is gonna be skin and mucous membranes. Now there is a reason that a butterfly is the logo for the Lupus Foundation and typically what the logo when we're talking about lupus in general. And the butterfly or the malar rash or the butterfly rash is a prototypical rash seen in lupus patients. But that does not mean every lupus patient gets it, but many do. And it's a rash that goes over the course of our, over the bridge of our nose and over our cheeks. And even though it's pretty recognizable, it can seem, it can be very different in different people. So some patients get very severe malar rashes where there can be crusting. Some patients just have a faint redness. Some people, the malar rash can extend down to the chin or even go up into the scalp and the forehead. So everyone's malar rash, just like everything else, can be different. And like I said, some patients will not have a malar rash. And rashes in general are very common amongst lupus patients, aside from the malar rash. It, lupus patients are notoriously photosensitive, meaning that they are very sensitive to the sun. UV light can precipitate a lupus flare, and that can be manifested by a skin rash, as well as a lot of other lupus symptoms. Um, but patients can get rashes on the skin that was exposed to the sun. They can get rashes on skin that wasn't exposed to the sun. So it's for this reason that we're always recommending using SPF and sun protective clothing to try to limit the exposure to that UV light and thus prevent either a skin or more severe flare. Now, with skin involvement, we also want to talk about alopecia or hair thinning. Hair thinning, unfortunately, is very common amongst lupus patients and it's very distressing. It can happen both during a flare and as the flare is recovering. And the type of hair thinning that typically happens will just be diffuse thinning. So patients will just notice that overall the volume of hair has decreased and it can be quite distressing it can be severe um, some patients have had to resort to using wigs to get through a particular flare thankfully most patients will have 
regrowth once the lupus is better controlled. It does not happen as quickly as everyone wants it to happen, but it typically will grow back. Now there are lots of other subtypes of alopecia that can be seen with lupus, um, and some of those subtypes can involve scarring where the hair won't grow back, but in general, the type of hair loss that lupus patients will experience is going to be diffuse and will grow back when the flare is better controlled. Now I also mentioned mucous membranes. And so I'm mainly gonna be talking about inside the mouth. And it's very common for patients to get little ulcers in the mouth. And oftentimes these ulcers are not painful. In fact, patients might not even know that they are there until the doctor does their physical exam. Now sometimes the ulcers can be painful, but in general, we always know that the painless oral ulcers are the ulcers that are most associated with lupus. And so I just throw that out there just as another piece of information, maybe next time you're brushing your teeth also make sure you check check for any of those ulcers in your mouth all right the next system is going to be our joints our musculoskeletal system lupus patients can get arthritis in the same pattern that rheumatoid arthritis patients can get arthritis and so i'm talking about joint pain and swelling of our small joints so the joints of our hands and the joints of our feet and ankles so hands wrists can be stiff swollen they can feel boggy when you touch Patients will wake up stiff in the morning. They'll need a solid hour to get moving and get going. You might find that you need to take an anti-inflammatory pain medicine like ibuprofen or naproxen. Um, hot showers can help warm things up. But this type of joint pain with associated with swelling is very common in lupus patients. In fact, it can oftentimes be the first symptom of a patient who's developing lupus. And it's for this reason that sometimes patients can get misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when they present to their doctor and they're having joint pain and don't really seem to have any other symptoms, they get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and get put on that, that treatment road. And it's just important that, especially if a young person is going to the doctor with joint pain in their hands and feet, that a full evaluation, not only looking for rheumatoid arthritis, but looking for a lot of other autoimmune conditions is done as sometimes lupus doesn't fully show itself until later and really can just be joint pain. All right, now the next symptom I'm gonna talk about is pretty common, but involves a part of the body that not everyone thinks about all the time. So we all know hearts and lung, like that's not what I'm talking about. Like we, we all know the heart and the lung um, and that they sit in the chest. But what we don't always think about is how the organs themselves are lined with a very thin tissue called pleura. Now, there's tissue around the lungs and there's tissue around the heart. When we're talking about the lung, we use the word pleura. When we're talking about the heart, we use the word pericardium. Um, but it's this very thin tissue. And with lupus, that tissue can become inflamed. Now, it can become inflamed with a lot of other conditions. But since we're talking about lupus and common symptoms in lupus, pleura and pericardium can become inflamed. Now, what does that mean? That means that for the lupus patient, they might feel pain in their chest. When they take a deep breath, when they expand their chest wall, it will hurt. Sometimes if they lay on their side or lay on their back, it can hurt. And that is called pleuritis when we're talking about the lung pleura or pericarditis when we're talking about the heart. And it can be pretty distressing. It's pretty common in the midst of a flare for patients to have chest wall pain for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons is the possibility of pleuritis or pericarditis. And it can, I bring that to your attention just because I know a lot of patients worry that they're having a heart attack or might be having a blood clot. And although I'm not gonna lie, those things can happen, they are not as common as having inflammation of that lining. And so I just bring that to your attention just so you know, and when you're in the midst of a flare, it's always important that you bring that up with your doctor. All right, you cannot talk about common symptoms and common manifestations in lupus without talking about the kidney. If anyone has done any Googling of lupus, they have undoubtedly come across kidney disease in lupus or nephritis, neph being kidney, itis being inflammation. And there's a reason it's, it's, 
needs to be identified early to prevent the long-term damage that can happen with kidneys, kidney inflammation. So when the kidney is inflamed because of lupus, if that inflammation goes on unchecked, or if someone happens to have a very aggressive type of lupus, that and that inflammation isn't completely brought down with medications, over time, the tissue in the kidney, the actual kidney itself, can start to dysfunction. And that dysfunction can progress to kidney failure, which when someone is in kidney failure is when they need to use dialysis and ultimately need a kidney transplant. So our job as rheumatologists is to identify lupus patients who have kidney inflammation and do everything in our power to stop that inflammation to prevent those other things from happening. Now, thankfully, we have some good medicines and kidney involvement in lupus really only happens in adults about 50 to 60% of the time. So not every lupus patient is going to have kidney problems, but a good chunk of them do, which is why every time if you have lupus, you're going to see the doctor, they're gonna do blood work and they're gonna do urine because those are the two ways we're able to see if someone has inflammation in their kidneys. Now, one thing I want to bring up, and we were talking about symptoms, and I haven't really talked about any symptoms associated with the kidney disease, or kidney inflammation, and that's because a lot of times when it's just inflammation we're talking about, there aren't specific symptoms associated with that kidney inflammation. And I say this because oftentimes patients with lupus are well aware of the kidney potential problems and get worried when they have back pain as a sign that perhaps that means their kidneys are inflamed. Most of the time that is not the case. Now that doesn't mean to say that you can have lupus patients out there walking around with kidney inflammation and not know it. Usually when the kidneys become inflamed it will correlate with a flare and a flare will have other symptoms usually, again, I always have to be hesitant when you're talking about lupus because the minute I start saying, you know, a symptom that happens or doesn't happen, I can immediately think of patients I've seen where that, the opposite was true. But usually during flares, there are lots of symptoms going on. People will have fatigue, hair loss, joint pain, rashes, chest pain, a lot of different things can be going on with the kidney inflammation. So even though the kidney inflammation in and of itself isn't causing a symptom, a lot of other symptoms are going on that clues both the patient and the doctor that, oh, we need to really not only get control of this, but take a good look at everything that's going on. So when you come to see the rheumatologist and you're in the midst of a flare, we are definitely going to be making sure that your kidneys are okay. And that's how we catch it. Symptoms of kidney failure. So when the inflammation in the kidney has been ongoing and the kidneys are starting to show signs of that and starting to show signs of dysfunction, signs, symptoms of kidney failure can be things like weight gain due to water retention, your legs can get swollen, you can have headaches and fatigue, chest pain, trouble breathing. Those can be signs of kidneys failing, which would be true if they're failing from diabetes or from any other medical conditions, not specific to lupus. But that, those are symptoms of the kidneys failing, not necessarily of kidney inflammation. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Um, but I just wanted to clarify, because I know there's always a lot of worry and stress that goes into every time people feel a little something in their back and they might have lupus and like, you know, ev everyone usually knows, oh my goodness, I don't want kidney problems or I don't want my kidney problems to get worse, that kind of thing. And I just want to provide a little clarity as to what it is that we're looking for as the rheumatologist. The last system I'm going to touch on is the nervous system. And the nervous system, uh, for those of you who aren't in medicine, um, can, is we're talking about the brain, which we say is the central nervous system, and the nerves of the body, which we call the peripheral nervous system. And so that entire system is oftentimes involved in lupus. Now, I, I put this here, and I wanted to talk about it, not necessarily because 
I have a lot of answers and we understand a lot about it, but because I want to bring it to everyone's attention that there are certain symptoms that involve the nervous system that we are still learning about and how they are associated with lupus. So if you look into the literature, the incidence of nervous system involvement with lupus is like a huge range between like five and 75%. And that's really dependent on how the researchers decided to define nervous system involvement. So if you define it as only seizures, strokes, and severe psychotic uh, manifestations, then thankfully that is going to not be very common and will only be a small proportion of lupus patients. But if you expand that definition to include patients with headaches, brain fog, numbness, or increased or um, I should say altered pain sensitivity, then all of a sudden you start capturing a lot more lupus patients. And that is why, I mean, we still are learning so much and trying to better understand and define what is happening with lupus patients as far as their nervous system. And I bring, wanted to bring this to your attention, not only because those less severe manifestations are actually very common, but to also alert patients and loved ones of patients that they should be brought up to your rheumatologist. That they are and can be manifestations of the lupus. Unfortunately though, that doesn't translate into lupus or our traditional lupus medications being the best treatment for those symptoms. And if all of this is confusing, that's right. <laughs> it's, it is confusing and really just highlights how there's still so much we need to learn about how the nervous system is involved when you have lupus. Like I said, thankfully, the more severe manifestations of nervous system involvement with lupus is rare. I'm talking about strokes, I'm talking about seizures or severe psychosis. Those happen, but they're rare. But what's more common are headaches, brain fog, fatigue, pain sensitivity changes and numbness throughout the body. What that means, how best to approach it, I don't really have all the answers to that. But I did want to bring to your attention that those symptoms do happen. So that's it. Those are some of the most common symptoms that we see in lupus. Oh, it's by far an exhaustive list. And I really wish I had more time. I don't want to drone on and on and on for an hours, which I know I can do, especially when talking about lupus. When I would give lectures, I was given 50 minutes to lecture and tell medical students everything they need to know about lupus. I would end up talking a mile a minute, barely taking a break for water. When it was over, I was like hunched over the podium, like heaving, like needing to catch my breath, which is kind of how I feel with this video too. Um, there's just always so much you can say about lupus um, because everyone is so different um, and I know there's always so many questions and I just that I'm just trying to get it all out so anyways I hope you found some nuggets of information in here I'm not quite sure there was much inspiration today but it's really just a lot of information I know that when you have lupus or you um, are a loved one of someone with lupus there's always more questions and answers and so if you found little answers in here um, I hope uh, I, I hope you did and I'm, I'm grateful that you gave me a little bit of your time and attention to try to help as always, thank you so much for stopping by. If you liked this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you want to hear more about lupus during Lupus Awareness Month, make sure you subscribe. Or if you're just interested in all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, mental health and wellness, make sure to hit that subscribe button because here at Connected Rheumatology, we really, really, really believe it is all connected. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.